Hey, Stephen. Today we talked to Paris Collingsworth, who is not only a research assistant professor here in the Department of um, Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue, but also is a Great Lakes ecosystem specialist with the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Yes, we definitely got it, the right person to talk about it's, it's different aspects of water quality here. Since this is what he's been researching, he did a great job talking about basically the amount of oxygen that's in the water and how that impacts the environment, the fish, the economics, water quality. He went into all these different variables, explaining it, did an excellent job there. He even taught us some information about why do lakes free, not freeze from the bottom up? which again, mm -hmm. is something I mentioned to you that uh, I actually understand that much more clearly now. And yes. uh, we might have even mentioned pirate ships somewhere in there and uh, fisheries, mm -hmm. climate change, a whole variety of awesome things. He did an excellent job explaining. So listen up to this one and uh, hope you enjoy. Welcome to Superheroes of Science. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We co-host Science from the Experts. Our guests are professionals doing cutting edge science right now. They're experts in their field discussing what they know best. So listen up and learn real science from real people. Subscribe now and stay informed of our latest episodes and show your support. Well, joining us today for Superheroes of Science, we're so pleased to welcome Paris Collingsworth. Paris is an assistant research professor in the Department of forestry and natural resources here at Purdue University, but he also um, is a Great Lakes Ecosystem Specialist with the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So we're so excited to welcome you and, um, and thanks for being here. I really appreciate you having me. Now, I, I know we want to go into the lake hypoxia, but before we go there, I mean, having a, what, what was that, a, the Great Lakes Ecosystem? Ecosystems. Mm -hmm. uh, having that as a title, I think you got to explain a little bit. What, what is a Great Lakes Ecosystem Specialist? Okay, yeah, sure. So um, so the, the group that I work with, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, um, sort of what they do is they work with, um, with scientists. And so I work with scientists around the Great Lakes. Um, I work with a group out of Chicago uh, with the EPA, their Great Lakes National Program Office. And the Great Lakes National Program Office, they're responsible for monitoring the environmental conditions of the Great Lakes as part of the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which is an agreement between the US and Canada. It goes all the way back to the 1970s. And so they monitor the environmental conditions in the Great Lakes. And then <clears throat> through my job with the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, um, I make sure that scientists around the Great Lakes uh, know about these monitoring programs that exist and they can use those data uh, to further their research. Um, so that's primarily what I'm doing uh, within Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. But then another piece of what Illinois Indiana Sea Grant does is they try to uh, communicate the science that's happening in the Great Lakes to the communities uh, around the Great Lakes. So more about communicating uh, the results of science uh, to just the general public or people who are interested in environmental issues around the Great Lakes. And why, what, I guess why would be my question on that. Why, if I lived close to the Great Lakes, which I'm, I'm a little bit of a distance, a couple hours from there. And so, but if I lived a lot closer, what, uh, how would this, the Sea Grant and the mission and things they're doing there, how would that benefit me? Why would I care or want to care? So yeah, the, the Great Lakes provide a lot of, you know, what we call ecosystem services. And so, so for example, one, one of the most like basic services uh, that we provide or that the Great Lakes provide are, you know, it's 20% of the fresh water in the world is in the Great Lakes. Um, and so a lot of people around the lakes rely on um, say like, so people in Northwest Lake uh, Indiana, they rely on Lake Michigan for their drinking water. Um, and so the water quality of the Great Lakes is really important to be able to communicate that uh, to the people there who are relying on, on that for their drinking water. Uh, and that's just one example. Another thing that, that I work on um, is fisheries. So, you know, people who are going out and they're, you know, fishing on the Great Lakes for either for recreation, there's also people who are commercial fishermen. 
uh, on the Great Lakes. And so they're actually catching fish for, for profit. And um, so we try to communicate um, the kind of changing ecosystem dynamics in the Great Lakes and how that might affect the, uh, the fisheries in the lakes as well and try to communicate to that, that to the public. So one thing, for example, is people, uh, like people are concerned about contaminants in the fish. There are uh, contaminants that have been out in the Great Lakes because of all of the industrial activity that's occurred in the Great Lakes. And um, so there can be these chemicals that sort of get into the fish tissue. And so one thing that, that Sea Grant might do is help to communicate whether or not fish are safe to eat um, and, and communicate that to, to people uh, in coastal communities and, and in throughout, you know, Illinois and Indiana overall. Okay. Yeah, I did not realize there were commercial fisheries on the Great Lakes. Yeah. There aren't many in the southern, uh, in, in, the, in our parts of the Great Lakes, but um, there are a lot of like native communities up in northern Lake Michigan that mm -hmm. commercially harvest, you know, primarily things like like whitefish, mm -hmm. uh, and then they sell those on market. Oh, amazing. Now, I'm part of you're, you're studying, you're looking at water quality and things, but one of the things we noticed that you're looking at is hypoxia. And mm -hmm. what is, first of all, what is hypoxia? So, I mean, in the kind of broadest terms, hypoxia is just a reduced amount of oxygen in the water. Uh, and it's, it's a phenomenon that happens a lot uh, in there are a lot of like, say, natural lakes. So another place, I study hypoxia primarily in central Lake Erie. Um, it's a really well-studied system, and we, we know a lot about, um, we still have a lot to learn, uh, but we do know, uh, we've been studying that for a long time. Um, but like, there are a lot of, say, natural lakes in, in northwest, uh, actually just northern Indiana, lakes that are um, glacial lakes. Uh, they, they were formed uh, by the glaciers of the last ice age. And um, they basically get deep enough to where uh, in the summer, they will form hypoxic layers on the bottom. And um, that is, you know, it's a bad thing for the, for the fish uh, in, in, those, in those lakes and, and in central Lake Erie. Yeah, let's break down a, a, just a little bit of foundation real fast, uh, just in case it's some people don't quite understand the, the oxygen side of things. I mean, I think most people understand that everything living re requires respiration, so it's breathing. But when you say oxygen in the water, uh, I just want to just do a quick clarification where we're not talking about like water, uh, mo water molecules H2O. Well, that's no. not what you're talking about, right? I'm talking, yeah. I'm talking about the, the amount of oxygen that's in the water that's available for for respiration for for organisms and is so that this the same is as what we measure here in the creek the dissolved oxygen levels yes okay. yeah and so there's a certain like saturation point where water can only hold so much you know available oxygen uh but it can also you know go down to where there's you know a, a phenomenon called like anoxia where there's like zero available dissolved oxygen for, and would be, you know, things that are available for, for fish to, you know, sort of pass over their gills for them to respire. Um, so yeah, that is the distinction there. And then you said that there could be layers within that. So does that have, I mean, could there be layers where there is oxygen, but then followed by layers where like- Yeah, there are. <laughs> Yeah, so, so it, it is a kind of a complicated uh, phenomenon, but um, one of the key things to understand, and it's a really important uh, principle of water, is that water achieves its maximum density at four degrees Celsius. And so, so the, the heavier water, the more dense water sinks to the bottom. That's why you have kind of, if you ever like swim in a pond and you go dive down deep, you can kind of feel when you get into that lower layer of water, it gets colder. Uh, and this is really fortunate for the life, you know, that exists in aquatic systems, because if water continued to get more dense as it got colder, if you think about it, then it would actually like a lake would freeze from the bottom up yeah. and that would mean it would freeze solid 
and it would kill everything in there. But as it is, water has a maximum density at four degrees. And so that lower level, that, low, that heavier water sort of sinks down to the bottom. And that's why ice floats. And so you actually can have a layer of cooler water or a layer of warmer water above that, that more dense layer that's on the bottom. And so what happens is in the summer, you have that lower level of cooler water, but then you have warming at the surface. And so you'll get what, what we call a stratified water column, where you have two very distinct layers of water. You have warm surface water, and then that warm surface water has two things happening. They have, it, it's interacting with the, with the atmosphere. So atmosphere, the oxygen from the atmosphere gets mixed in with the water. Say if you have wind and it's like stirring up waves. Uh, but you also have uh, photosynthesis that happens. You have, you know, tiny phytoplankton, little tiny plants that are uh, photosynthesizing, and then they produce oxygen. So they do that in that layer. So this layer, this surface layer can be well oxygenated, but then you have <clears throat> this density difference where you'll have what we call a thermocline. And that's like the, a very, very sharp change in temperature between the warm surface water and then the cold bottom water. And that pretty much isolates those two, uh, those two layers of water. Mm -hmm. And so that bottom layer, it's not exposed to the atmosphere and it's also too deep, there's not enough light for photosynthesis. And so the only thing that happens down there is you have um, microorganisms and things that are breaking down organic material. There's decomposition that happens in that layer. And so they're using the oxygen, they're respiring while they're doing this, but they're not, there's no oxygen that's replacing it. And so that's why through time, it just draws out all of the oxygen in that layer of water. Huh. And, and that's how you can get hypoxia. That's Sorry, I'm going to have to take this thing. shirt off because this is a, uh, I think my sweatshirt is making noise. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a natural phenomenon. The, uh, forestry shirt, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, hypoxia is a, it, it is a natural phenomenon. The thing is, though, is that uh, human activity can make it worse because humans if we're humans tend to um when we're around and using like water bodies we tend to do things like we uh increase nutrients going into the into the water so if there say there are a lot of this is what happens in lake erie um there are a lot of there's a lot of agricultural development in the watersheds around lake erie so a lot of these farm fields and then they're, they're adding fertilizer to their fields and then that fertilizer runs off into the streams and eventually makes its way into Lake Erie. So we're increasing the amount of nutrients in the lake, which that increases the photosynthesis that can happen in that surface layer. But that also increases uh, the biomass, the amount of algae that's produced. Then that dies and sinks and goes down into the bottom. And then so there's more food for those microorganisms and things that are down in that bottom layer. So it can really quickly uh, use up all of the oxygen because they have more food, basically. And so uh, what do you do about that? Well, <laughs> the one thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to um, reduce the amount of nutrients that are coming in from the watershed. So um, there are a lot of things that can happen in agriculture that uh, can, can be done to improve water quality, uh, things like uh, best management practices uh, for agricultural lands. Um, and this is something that there's a lot of uh, research that's done on this at Purdue in the, in the College of Agriculture. Um, but basically, so best management practices are, you can just think of them as ways of trying to slow down water on land. So, you know, when you have a field and you just have bare dirt in the winter, you haven't planted anything and water comes on there, it just rushes right off and goes straight into the streams. Um, but there are practices where you can do things like you can plant buffer strips, you can plant strips of grass, you know, along the waterways, and that slows down the water. 
uh, from getting in there. And basically it holds those nutrients more on the soil, which is what you want as a, as a farmer, you want those, those fertilizers that you're putting to stay on your, on your land and not work its way into Lake Erie. Um, there are all sorts of different, um, best management practices that have been uh, developed through time. And the key is to, you know, try to get farmers to adapt them. You know, it's not something that we can force anybody really to do, but um, it's, mo it's more about education. So things like Illinois and Indiana Sea Grant, you know, trying to communicate the science uh, to, to different people. And, and Purdue has an extension office that does all of this too, as well. It's not just Illinois Indian Sea Grant. Awesome. Now, how you're doing research? Uh, sir, did I cut you off, Sarah? No. Okay. Uh, you're doing actually research on hypoxia. How are you? What does that involve? I know that you'd mentioned you the background you have now on your on your screen. You're doing day and night sampling, and and so mm -hmm. how does how do you do the sampling? How are you measuring this? What is involved with actually researching this? Okay, that, that's a good question. Yeah, so um, the the EPA Great Lakes National Program Office, uh, you know, the ship that is here in my background, uh, they have a dissolved oxygen monitoring program that go. They've done this since like the late late eighties, early nineties, and so what they do is they go out, they take this this big ship that's that's behind me, and they go to ten stations out in Central Lake Erie. Uh, during the summer. So they start typically around, uh, you know, late June. This is the, like the hypoxic season. It starts, you know, that's when the water gets, starts to get, become stratified when you start to see those two, you know, distinct layers of water. Um, so they go out and start in, starting around, you know, uh, late June. And then they go through usually like late se September, early October. Uh, and they'll, they'll go out and they just basically do uh, CTD casts, which uh, it's a it's a instrument that has a, a sensor for conductivity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. Uh, and they lower it down in the water column, down to the bottom at these 10 stations. And so they get this sort of record of what the water column looks like. And they've been doing that, you know, like I said, since the the 80s and, and early 90s. And so we have this long-term record of uh, the, the seasonal prog progression of hypoxia uh, in the central basin going back uh, for, for decades. Um, so that's one way to do it. Uh, and, and we do use a, that, that information. I've had some students who have used those data sets to sort of go back and, and try to look at it how you know like how those uh dynamics of dissolved oxygen have changed through time um another thing that we've been doing uh more recently uh this was started back in 2014 um and what what we've started to do is we'll go out and we'll put uh, temperature and dissolved oxygen loggers on the bottom so rather than having to go out on the ship and take the time to go to all these 10 stations We'll go out once at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the hypoxic season and we'll drop a sensor on the bottom. So these sensors are anchored to the bottom and they'll sit out there all through all throughout the season. And every like every 10 minutes, then they record the temperature and the dissolved oxygen over the span of months. Mm -hmm. um, but then what we can do with that is we can cover a much broader area and we can get a lot more information about like kind of the short-term things things that are happening in between those you know two weeks when the, when the ship is out there How do you and so we can come <laughs> um so there's a couple different ways uh when we first put them out there we put them on these devices called um, an acoustic release so it's just basically like a big post that has a hook on the bottom and then that hook has a little motor that if you play this acoustic signal from a from the boat that it'll turn that that hook and so you could make that hook you could hook that thing on an anchor and it would sit down there and then you come and it's got floats on it too obviously you want it to float when it <laughs> when he, and so then you would you would make sure it's locked and put it down there and then you can come back you know several months later play that acoustic signal and it turns that little anchor and then they pop up Oh, wow. So that was the way we initially did it, but we actually lost some 
that way because <laughs> the, you know the battery went bad or something so now a much more kind of it's more uh it's less technically advanced but more foolproof is uh it's just you you put out like a what's called a, like a grappling chain so you have an anchor and then you have a, a chain a, a line that's going off to another anchor and you really carefully you know with a gps unit or whatever you mark where those two points are and you come back later and you throw out a hook and you hook hook that line and then bring everything up oh wow um, yeah well, so it's they, less technical but yeah the work you mentioned that it includes like like some gps coordinates with that and that you're mm -hmm. data and and sometimes even as much as like every 10 minutes collecting the data what i guess i have two questions what sorts of things do you do with the data once you have the data you know how, how are you using that data and i and also is any of that data available um to the public like if they wanted to see that and and run some of their own you know yeah. experiments and things Yes. So, so, so that's a, so if you really think about it, so if we have the first time we put those loggers out there, we put about 25 of them out there and we, um, and so all these are going down at different times, you know, but, but we're keeping track of the time and everything. And um, when we, when we got them back, we, um, we ended up, we figured out it's something like each logger, produce somewhere around 25,000 data points. Like that was like for the, for the season. And so the, you start, you know, multiply that by 25 and, and then you start, you know, you're like, wow, we got a lot of data here. Um, so I actually worked with, um, I had a grad student who's, that was his project. His, he was really interested in um, like developing algorithms. He was really into computer coding and, and developing algorithms. And so we just put him on it and he um and so he developed this algorithm that's available it's available online uh it's on github which is just a, a place where a lot of this type of research goes and um so he developed this automated computer program that could take pull in all that data and then it syncs them it puts them all on the same like timestamp, and then it would calculate we would take all of those 10 minute you know interval samples and calculate a daily average. So at each site, we would have a daily average of hypoxia for that site, for that, for that particular station. And then he developed a statistical algorithm that basically does, it's called like interpolation. So if you have a value at one point and then a value at another point, you can actually like do some statistics to estimate what it's likely the conditions are in between those points. And so we have this big network of loggers. And so we could actually take uh, within that network, which it covered about 7,000 square kilometers, we could estimate the spatial extent of hypoxia. So how much of that area is, is hypoxic? And so that was, uh, it was an important thing to do because there's actually some language in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that says that uh, the US and Canada will work to reduce the extent of hypoxia in, in the waters of the Great Lakes. And so when you start to think about that, you know, that's some like kind of fuzzy language. It's like, what does that mean? What, is, what does extent mean? Well, to me, my, my first thought is spatial extent, like the area that hypoxia covered. So we were kind of, well, not the first, we were definitely, um, and that was a good effort, you know, to try to estimate, like, what is the spatial extent of hypoxia? Um, and now we actually have, we've sort of done this more and more. And now we have a, a logger network that was out there this past year um, that does cover the entire, pretty much the entire central basin of Lake Erie. And um, probably I'll be getting those data probably within the next couple of weeks, and then we're going to actually be able to calculate what is the real like spatial extent of hypoxia in Lake Erie. And so that's, it's good to have that as a reference point. So now you can go back and you can do all these things to try to fix the water quality that's going on to Lake Erie. And then we can see, we can like do this year after year, and we can determine if we're actually like reducing the spatial extent of hypoxia through time.
Well, that's great. Yeah, just definitely to have, you know, as scientists should have that data and, and know what you have and then be able to look, okay, now are these efforts that we're doing, are these helping any? Are they hopefully not, yeah. but you know, hopefully <laughs> improvement? Yeah. That's great. How, how deep is it? If you have to hook them to get them up, how deep is that? So, so this is actually, so uh, when I mentioned that uh, Lake Erie, uh, you know, this hypoxic phenomenon, it's a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And um, what's, what we're really trying to wrap our heads around is um, like how much we can do to fix hypoxia, to be honest, because Lake Erie is so in, I'll, I'll get to why, <laughs> like the, to answer your question, um, but it, it ties all into this. Um, so Lake Erie, the central basin of Lake Erie, is, I mean, it's almost shaped just like a bowl. And the, the maximum depth is about um, 22 meters. So that's, that's about 66 feet, um, which is not, for the Great Lakes, that's not very deep. Um, you know, the, like parts of Lake Michigan are, you know, 300 meters deep. It's, you know, there are, there are definitely, the Great Lake, Lake Erie is the, by far the shallowest of the Great Lakes. Um, in the central basin, you know, so you have this bowl that's about, it's on average about 20 meters deep. And then the, that thermocline, that, that thing that sort of differentiates the two layers of water goes down to about 16 meters. And so you have, what you have is this tiny little sliver on the bottom that is this, this bottom layer, this, this cold bottom layer that becomes hypoxic. And they're just, there's just not enough water down there. There's so much biological activity that, you know, it, it, under most circumstances, it, it probably would be, become hypoxic. And so, so, you know, take, for example, so there's another basin, there's an eastern basin of Lake Erie that is much deeper. And so there, they have that same surface water layer that just goes down to 16 meters, but they might have, you know, up to, you know, like a hundred more meters of water below that. And so the same processes are happening, but there's just so much water there. They don't deplete all the oxygen. And so that's what happens in the other lakes. And so when we talk about um, central Lake Erie, you know, it's almost like they call it like kind of like the Goldilocks zone, you know, it's like just perfect. It's perfect conditions for establishing hypoxia. And so, you know, it's a natural phenomenon. Um, we certainly make it worse. Um, you know, I, I mentioned there's the nutrients that go in there, but there's also, you know, the potential effects of climate change um, that could, that could, uh, you know, make, make this a phenomenon worse uh, through time. And, um, and so, um, so yeah, that's so sorry. That was a long answer to tell you what the depth of <laughs> Central Lake Erie is, uh, but it does uh, the the depth of of the Central Basin of Lake Erie really ties into the story of hypoxia. Well, no, it explains that very well. It explains the depth of the different things. Just uh, the reason I ask is when you talk about uh, hooking them because you have stretched and you, you hook the sensors to pull up your log your data loggers. I just I mean I envision Paris at the end of the boat with a long shepherd's hook going like this <laughs> pulling it up, you know. But uh, uh if, if you guys are doing more of a drag, do you ever catch things other than what you're looking for? Not in my experience. Okay. No, <laughs> not I mean, in my pirate ship or something. I don't know. I mean, yeah. No, I we have had we that's the funny thing about when you when you put things off the boat like one you better be prepared that it's never coming back you know that's the first thing but then the other yeah you might something something might happen i was actually there there's a different um instrument that we use uh for for research it's called the a triaxis which is like it's just basically this vehicle that tows behind the boat and it goes kind of like this through the water column and it takes all these measurements um and it has a fiber optic cable and so it gives you the data in real time I can just sit there and watch the computer and like see the different parameters uh, that we're measuring through time. Uh, but we did one time put that out and um, we hit an unmarked shipwreck. So we knew we hit something, we could feel it. And then we brought it in and there was a big piece of wood stuck into the, uh, into the fiberglass. And 
we found out later it was a, an unmarked shipwreck. And so someone went back and they identified what ship it was. And, was it a pirate ship? Uh, it was not a pirate ship. I think it was just a, I think it was just a ship that transported wood. Wow. <laughs> yeah, someone has to ask. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I would fund your we do. years if you found pirate's treasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, so so I one thing I did want to talk about is you know, and and we've been thinking about this a lot lately. Is like so you know, like why do you care? You already did you know sort of ask that question, um, uh, but the kind of the more we learn about this hypoxia, like the more we learn about how like dynamic it is. Um, so one thing that we never really appreciated until we put those loggers out there, until we were getting these like really like fine um, temporal scales, like we were measuring things really frequently. Uh, what we learned is like, it's, so it's this layer of water that's sitting on the bottom, but it sloshes around, it moves. And so, so for example, so if you have like a storm that comes through and there's a lot of wind that's blowing that surface water, that surface water will move and it'll stack up. So it's called like a sesh. And so you'll have like the surface water will stack up on one side of the lake. But then there's the, all this like area over here that the, the bottom water kind of comes up and moves up into this area. And so that's called an upwelling event. So you can have this upwelling of water from the bottom. And that's important for things like, like water intakes. So there's this big program right now that's run by NOAA where they actually try to, they take a lot of the data and some of the data is these logger data and they've developed this model where they can predict where the hypoxic water is going based on the seven day forecast. And so they can actually give water managers, like people who run you know, water intakes, they can give them a warning to say, hey, you know, in a couple of days, you might have this big pulse of hypoxic water coming in. And that's important because it doesn't mean that the water is bad necessarily. Like it's not like, you know, toxic chemicals or whatever are moving around, but there are taste and odor problems that come with it. You know, there's this water, you know, it's kind of, it kind of, it's a different color because there's manganese that's released uh, in, in hypoxic conditions. Uh, and there's kind of off flavors and, and odors. And so that gives, if they have this forecast, that gives the water, water plants like the, the sort of lead time that they need to know, okay, we're going to have to start treating the water. Um, differently, you know, than what we would if this was not hypoxic water. So that, yeah, so that, and then that, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, is that, that, that sort of movement of the hypoxic water, um, it actually, you know, the, so the fish are responding to that too. You know, they don't want to be in that hypoxic water. So they're actually moving around in response to this as well. And um, there actually are commercial fisheries in Lake Erie and the commercial fishermen, they actually bring, they're, they're, they, want, they want to know where the hypoxic layer are because the fish sort of stack up like really close to like the interface between the hypoxic water and the non-hypoxic water. And if that moves, that means those fish are gonna move. And so that can move that, the fish into their equipment. And so they can actually increase their catches of fish if they can predict you know, where that hypoxic layer is moving around. So it does have, you know, beyond just the kind of interesting ways that it forms, it does have, you know, effects on those ecosystem services like water supply, like fish production. Now, does strong atmospheric currents cause the, that layer, the hypoxic um, area or layer to dissipate some? So the, this, it's, this is like a really um, active kind of area of research with these modelers because the 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 actual like layer that bottom layer it can it does some weird things sometimes sometimes it can become like concave uh mm -hmm. convex and um it, it, it sort of well we'll just say bowl shaped <laughs> and it and so then it it kind of stretches up on and comes into like more near shore areas and then sometimes it'll be shaped like this it's um it, it changed, so the atmospheric conditions change the sort of shape of the hypoxic layer. And that has really uh, strong implications for like how quickly say the, the, the dissolved oxygen is, 
is taken out of that layer. So if you have like a really thin sort of layer that's sort of hugging the, the bottom, then it, it gets depleted really rapidly because that thickness of that layer is really strongly related to how quickly the, the dissolved oxygen gets used up in that layer. Okay. Now it's, I don't know, part of me wants to say it's like, hey, can't you just put a bubbler in there and uh, you know, <laughs> pump air down there? So, you know, uh, it, yeah. something like this plausible? Well, you know, you're talking about, like I said, the, the dissolved oxygen layer that we, or I'm sorry, the, the logger network that we put out in 2014, that's the only time I measured the area, you're, but I know it was like 7,200 kilometers, you know, so that, that's a big, it's a, you're talking about a pretty big area. Uh, one thing though, that is, and I, I kind of handed, I talked about climate change. And so climate change can affect hypoxia. If we do, so if you just take everything, you know, there are a lot of things that come with climate change, but you know, one of the most obvious things is like increasing temperatures. Yeah. So if you have increasing temperatures, you know, the first thing that's gonna happen is you're going to sort of speed up that stratification process where you have the, the water sort of separating out into the two layers. And so that means that that bottom layer is gonna be isolated for a longer amount of time. And so you're gonna increase the duration of the hypoxic period. You know, that's one thing. But one of the other uh, predictions for, for climate change is that we're gonna have more frequent storms. Um, you know, there'll be more frequent storm events. And so when you combine more frequent storm events with increased temperatures, what that does to the physics of the water, it actually deepens the thermocline. So it makes that surface water that layer deeper, it makes it go down deeper. And as I mentioned, like there's not much of a bottom layer in central Lake Erie as it is. So one thing that we've just sort of been trying to wrap our heads around is, you know, will climate change get rid of hypoxia? Because you, you will it all be a surface layer? Because we've, we've deepened the thermocline so much. I mean, that'll change from year to year. Um, but there certainly is, that, that, that's certainly a possibility. Are there um, environmental benefits of having that, a, a layer with low amount of oxygen in it at the bottom? I mean, it's a natural thing. If we, if uh, something happens and does take that away, will there be environmental consequences? Yeah, certainly. So, um, so this is another thing that we, we looked at. Um, there is one of the more in, one of the, biggest kind of stressors in the Great Lakes is invasive species. So species from other areas coming in. And there's one species in particular uh, that's been really problematic in the Great Lakes and it's quagga mussels. Um, first it was zebra mussels and everybody sort of heard about zebra yeah, I've mussels. I've heard of that one. Yeah, but then quagga mussels are, I mean, it's the same. If I, if I held up a quagga mussel and a zebra mussel, you, I mean, I, I don't think I can tell the difference. Uh, they're, it's, they're the same genus. Um, the difference is, is that zebra mussels came in first and zebra mussels uh, can only colonize shallow areas and they can only colonize, they have to have a hard substrate to, to attach to. So the, you know, so the big thing with uh, zebra mussels when they first came in was they kept clogging like industrial pipes because they would get, you know, they would, attached to the pipes and they would clog the pipes. So it became a big economic problem to clean those. Um, quagga mussels came in later, uh, but then quagga mussels have been more problematic because they can colonize deeper areas and they don't need hard substrates. So they can actually just make a, a total blanket of, of mussels that go, uh, they're still expanding out into Lake Michigan into the deeper areas. And so what these things do is they just, they filter feed. So they take a lot of the phytoplankton out of the system. And, you know, the, and so instead of that phytoplankton, which is the base of the food web, instead of that feeding up to the fish, yeah. you know, that, you know, like salmon, if you want to go out and fish for salmon in Lake Michigan, it's all going into biomass of these mussels on the bottom. Um, so in Lake Erie, you know, so the, so the quagga mussels, they're everywhere. They produce, they reproduce, they, 
put out these um, these little tiny things called villagers that are kind of like little zooplankton that like they float out, float around until they like settle down into the bottom and then they become, um, you know, they become the muscles. Mm-hmm. Um, so these villagers are just everywhere in the Great Lakes. There are so many quagga mussels and the Great Lakes are kind of like a river system. So like the water's flowing. So there's, there's these villagers everywhere. Um, but there aren't a lot of quagga mussels in central Lake Erie. And the reason for that is the hypoxic layer. Because, and we can, and we can go out and measure this. And we've, we've published a paper a few years back where you can look at this area and you can look at the area of the bottom that becomes hypoxic. And you can see, like if you go to an area that's not hypoxic, you can see all sorts of different sizes of, um, of these quagga mussels. You can see adults, you can see, you know, little ones. And, but if you go to the hypoxic layer and look at the bottom, all you see is the little tiny, uh, the little tiny juveniles. There aren't adults. And that's just because those little tiny juveniles haven't died yet. You know, the hypoxic layer hasn't killed them um, yet. And so you come back the next year, there's nothing there, you know, because they died. Mm. And so, so that hypoxic layer is really like kind of keeping quagga mussels from establishing in central Lake Erie, um, which, you know, is a probably a good thing. You know, if, if, if that were to go away and quagga mussels come into Lake Erie, then you have a situation where you're going to have a lot of, um, you know, reduction in, in phytoplankton biomass and mm-hmm. reduction in just, you know, productivity in general. I, I love that explanation how, you know, yeah, hypoxia, I think initially when I heard it, I thought, oh, so this is a bad thing. It needs fixed. But then to hear this and think, but no, it's, that's a natural thing. It's keeping things in check by being there. So it's something to not necessarily doesn't need fixed it's it's something it's a well yeah i mean the the thing i would say is it's definitely a natural phenomenon we don't need to make it any worse that's Mm -hmm. for sure um but um but it's just it's kind of a fun you know kind of mind game to play like so what if this goes away like what what happens and what are the potential like kind of unforeseen circumstances that would would happen Definitely. Well, it's it's a large scale version of I mean balance. It's such as we don't think about that the natural balance within ecosystems and how many factors there are in that balance and how many consequences there can be once that balance shifts one way or another are things that we don't think about. It's like you're like oh climate change might could possibly even get rid of that layer. We're like cool, you know, more <laughs> more good fresh water. They're like. And also change that habitat yeah. make more uh, or better preferred for invasive species, which could, I'm like, oh, but they're going to clean the water. That's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now they're taking the food. I'm like, yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah. There's another thing. So about that, like that climate change thing in the, in the layer of water is a lot of the native species in the Great Lakes are what we call like cold water species. So they're species that like, they don't like that warm water. And so there are um, species, like I already mentioned, uh, like Lake, Lake Whitefish. Uh, Lake Whitefish is a native species uh, to the Great Lakes. Um, we, we fish them commercially. You know, it's a very valuable asset. Um, but the water in that, that surface water in central Lake Erie, they, it gets too warm. And that doesn't mean that like they'll just die you know they'll move they'll go somewhere else but if you're in you say you're a commercial fisherman in central lake erie and you're wanting to catch lake whitefish you know if we lose that you know, there's there's the the hypoxia that's going to like drive them away anyways but if they had you know uh an oxygenated bottom layer of water they'd be happy to be right there uh, you know so but that surface water is too warm for them. So they can get up into that surface water, but they're really uncomfortable. So they're gonna move and they're gonna move to a place where, so if you're a commercial fisherman and you're, you're wanting to catch like whitefish, you're gonna have to go you know, to a different part of the lake if, if that's what you're targeting. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of different you know, sort of things that interact and it's, it's complex processes. <laughs> 
these are variables we oftentimes don't think about. It's we look at a big picture. It's so easy to look at a big picture and not think about how many small things are in a balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that's awesome. And it's, we really appreciate you bringing some of those to light to us and kind of getting us thinking about these things with, with different types of water quality. And in particular, I'm really still a little disappointed didn't find a pirate ship. Uh, <laughs> well, we found a shipwreck. Yeah, they, yeah it's real still. <laughs> great uh, thank you we appreciate your time yeah, yeah. yes no problem it's my pleasure thank you for listening to this episode of science from the experts from purdue university superheroes of science if you like this episode subscribe give us a positive view and share the love Boiler up. hammer down <laughs>